Something horrible happened in Nigeria in 1996. A young granite seller was lured into a popular hotel where he was brutally murdered and then beheaded for the purpose of money rituals. This hotel was named to be the Otokoto Hotel, owned by a popular businessman, Chief Vincent Duru, aka Chief Otokoto. Now, after the killing of the granite seller, the victim's head was then shipped as a parcel for delivery from Owere to another community in Imo State called Eziyama Community in Ikeduri local government of Imo State, a near 40 minutes journey from the hotel to the community. Unfortunately for this package delivery, it wasn't successful. The delivery man was caught and arrested, and this case blew up to be one of the most shocking, disturbing, and disgusting money ritual scandal in Africa in the 21st century. This scandal would go on to be called the Otokoto Money Ritual Scandal, of 1996, which led to a major riot in Oweri, called the Otokoto Riots. But there is something about this story that seemed to have been forgotten. Something about this story that history has somehow omitted. Everything you thought you knew about the Otokoto money ritual story is about to change. So fasten your seatbelts because this is going to be a bumpy ride. But before we continue, make sure you like, share, and click the subscribe button if you haven't subscribed. And while you're there, let me know in the comment section where you're watching from. Now, the Otokoto money ritual story is one that has been told multiple times. In blogs, on the news, by content creators. Hell, even I myself have talked about this story earlier on when we started this channel. And frankly, it became one of the most intriguing, weird, disturbing story that I have ever come across. But there was something about the story then when I learned about it that did not make sense. And it made me dig deeper. Because I assure you, your mind will also change by the time you're done with this video. I'm going to let you know the popular story and then we will talk about the actual story, the actual events that happened in the Otokoto saga and we will look at the entire case as a whole and how it played out in court. And if we still have more time, we will share our opinions. But I need you all to understand something while talking about the story, I will be giving my thoughts on certain aspects because this story has so many layers, multiple layers. I had to read court documents. I had to go as far back as 1996 to see what the newspapers or the articles were being written in real time as at the time this event happened. Because you know when stories get retold multiple times, certain things get lost in translation. Certain people who play a role in a particular story get to be omitted as a whole. And there was somebody in this Otokoto money ritual story that was completely omitted, that is rarely seen in the retelling of this story. And this person is the one who would change the entire narrative as we know it. Now, the popular narrative of the Otokoto story, the ones you'll see in blog, goes like this. Chief Otokoto, Chief Vincent Duru, is in his popular Otokoto hotel in Oire, Douglas Road, and he seems to have gotten a call from somebody who needed a package. We are made to understand that this is a man who, although has multiple businesses, is an underground body part dealer. So, with that in mind, on that day, the 19th of September, he is believed to be in his hotel room and somebody tells him that they need a human head. They call his gardener, a 32 year old man named Innocent A.K. Ayanwu, who works as a gardener for the Otokoto Hotel premises. So on this day, Chief Vincent Duru, Chief Otokoto, calls Innocent A.K. Ayanwu into his room and tells him, see, a man in Eziyama named Chief Leonard Unago needs a human head. Find somebody and get that human head to him. Innocent Eke Anyamu went on to do the job he had been ordered to do. The narrative goes as though after he was given the instruction, he came outside to the hotel looking for somebody whose head he was going to use for this delivery. When upon he meets a young granite seller, a young boy hawking granite. He talks to the boy, tries to buy some granites from the boy and convince the boy to follow him into the hotel under the premise that he would help the boys sell more granodes to customers in the hotel. And the hotel was a fancy one at the time in a way, a very big and admirable one. So this young granode seller sees it as a business opportunity. So he follows Innocent Eke Anyangu into the Otokoto Hotel, into the reception where he sat and waited for customers to come and buy his granodes. 
Somewhere along the line, it was said Innocent Eke Anyamu gave him a bottle of Coke to chill and relax and enjoy the view of this luxurious hotel. And the boy drinks the bottle of Coke while at the reception, falls asleep, and that was when it was said that Eke Anyamu came over, picked up this boy on his shoulders, carried him upstairs to a room in the hotel dedicated to butcher human parts. And that was where the boy was said to have been killed brutally and butchered and his head was taken for the package delivery. There were claims that other parts of his body were invested and given to Chifotokoto himself for his own personal use, while the head per se was what the customer needed. So after that was done, he tells Chifotokoto, it is done, I've done what you asked me to do. And Chifotokoto tells him, all right, go and deliver it to Chief Leonard Unago, who stays in Aizyama in Ikeduru local government. After that, Innocent Eke Anyamu puts this boy's head in a bulletin bag, comes out of the hotel, enters a motorcycle, and headed for Iziyama. But when he got there, Chief Leonard Unago, who was supposed to receive this package, was not around. And so he had to come back. However, the motorcycle he entered that would take him to a motor park noticed something strange about the waterproof, the, the plastic bag he was holding. He noticed that it was leaking blood and he also noticed that it was round and this bike man somehow knew that it was a human head that was in it. So after dropping Innocent Eke Anyamu at the park to get a bus to back to Oweri or a taxi back to Oweri, this bike man named Opara went to the police station and told the police that he saw a young man heading to Oweri with a plastic bag that contained a human head. And the police at Hiho another community which I believe you have to pass through to get to Oweri. So the police at Hiho set up a blockade at the major road linking to Oweri, searching every vehicle for the said man and the said bulletin bag that contained the human head. And luckily for them, they were able to find the taxi that Innocent Eke Anyangu was in heading to Oweri, where he was caught arrested and found with the human head. He was then taken to the police station where he made the confession that it was his boss who sent him to deliver it to Chief Leonard Onagu. And that was how the case blew up. We now got to hear while he was in the police station, just for four days, making the confession, he was eventually poisoned to death. That was how Innocent Eke Ayanwu was murdered in prison. And this was the time everybody became outraged in Oweri because they now figured that somebody is trying to silence him from speaking and exposing the truth of the rich men in Oweri and what they do underground to get their wealth. And it was after the death of Innocent Eke Ayanwu that the riot, the Otokoto riot, began. Now, the case would go to court. Chief Otokoto would be arrested. Six other people who worked for him in his hotel would also be arrested. Chief Leonardo Nago would be arrested. And all seven of these men will be called the Otoko to Seven and they will be charged to court for the killing of the granite seller who goes by the name of Antoni Ikechuku. And eventually, many of them, including Chief Otokoto himself, will be sentenced to death. Now, that is the popular narrative. Let's talk about the actual events that happened at the time. And while we are doing this, we would also compare with the popular story, just for clarity. Now, it is important to know something. When talking about the Otokoto story, there are three things to put in mind. The first thing is, what was the atmosphere in Imo State like? How was Oweri like in this 1996 September? This is actually very important. Now, around this time in Imo State, in Oweri, there was a undertone crisis that was going on amongst the masses. There was a high rate of kidnapping and a high rate of, you know, kidnappers demanding ransom from their victims' family. But the thing is, these kidnappers were targeting the rich and powerful people. They were not kidnapping poor people. A kidnapper would not kidnap a granite seller. A kidnapper would not kidnap a, a orange seller or a market woman. Doctors, politicians, rich men's children, rich man's wife, businessmen, those were the targets for the kidnappers. And there was a high rate of such a thing. When they kidnap you, you're asked to pay a ransom. And once the payment is made, you're released. Another thing that was also happening was that there were a few cases of bodies being found in bushes or along the road whose organs 
appeared to have gone missing. Now, the narrative at the time was these are people whose family could not pay the ransom for their victims. And there was also the narrative that these were victims of money rituals. So this is 1996. This is Oeri. So many people believed that, okay, this is more of a money ritual situation. Why they believed so was there was also, uh, on the flip side, a group of young men becoming millionaires overnight. You'll see a young man going to the mechanic to learn handwork. In the next two months, he's opening businesses, buying cars. So there was this mentality that where are all these young boys becoming rich from overnight? Just the way we have it today where somebody becomes rich overnight because of Yahoo Yahoo that we now know. That was sort of like the situation back then in Oere around this period of time. Young boys and men were just becoming wealthy overnight. Somebody who you know who used to be poor becomes rich the next day. While kidnapping and ransom are being paid on the side and dead bodies are being found without their head, private parts and organs. So the regular masses mentality in Oberi was that these rich people becoming wealthy overnight are the ones behind the kidnapping and the money ritual that they suspect. But nobody was suspected. They didn't have any, you, you, you had it in mind, but you don't know how to prove it, which is where this story picks up from. That is one thing to know when understanding the Otokoto money ritual story. The next thing to know is the Otokoto Hotel itself. Now, Otokoto Hotel is one of many businesses under the Otokoto groups of uh, businesses. It was also, at the time in 1996, this hotel was nearly 30 years old. And I think this was one part of the story that blew my mind. This was a hotel that had existed for 30 years. 30 years. That is right from the 70s. Towards the end of the Nigerian Civil War, this hotel, this Chief Otokoto himself was building these businesses. That's where it started from. The hotel itself was older than Imo State. At the time, this hotel already started uh, business. Imo State had not even been created. Right from the 70s to the 80s, into the 90s, the Otokoto Hotel existed, along with other business that Chief Vincent Duru owned. He owned a pharmacy, uh, he owned, he owned a, uh, a barbing salon, he owned supermarkets, car wash. There were so many businesses under this Otokoto venture that this man owned. He was a successful businessman. He had children who lived abroad, and they were also successful too. So the Otokoto business was flourishing. And the hotel had three buildings as of 1996. It had three buildings beside each other. And all three of these buildings were about two to three story high each. And by the back of the last building, there was still space for more land. There was still more land for future projects to be built under the Otokoto Venture. And in 1996, it was believed the land at the back of the hotel after the third building was used as a farmland, maybe for Tokoto wife or relatives who would farm there. Another thing to also know about the hotel is Chief Vincent during himself had a special room in the hotel. I think most hotel owners usually have their place in the hotel. So there's a room whenever he's in town, he can go to his hotel. They always have a place, an executive suite for him where he meets up with his um, managers that manages all his other business. Also know this. He was not the one managing the Otokoto Hotel itself. There was a man named Ebenezer who was his friend, childhood friend, and around his age too, he was the one managing the hotel. His chemist, that is pharmaceuticals, was managed by his brother-in-law named Rufus Ayaun. So these businesses owned by Otokoto groups were not directly managed by Chief Otokoto himself. He had people in charge people in charge of the running of the business day to day. He was just a CEO. Whenever he was in town, he would go to his hotel room and call a meeting of all his managers. They talk about the business, they talk about what to do and how to move on. Another thing about the Otokoto Hotel is it was in the heart of Oweri, Douglas Road as at the time. So this was a big city then. It was in the middle of a good place where people frequented. It was a hotel that was very well known. 
Now that we know the backstory of the atmosphere in Owerri and how the Otokoto Hotel was, let's look at the actual event that happened as documented. The first thing that we know happened for a fact was the killing of Anthony Ikechuku, the granite seller. He was lured by innocent Eke Anyamu, who was a gardener at Otokoto Hotel. He was lured, killed, and beheaded. And after he was killed, innocent Eke Anyamu put his head in a plastic bag and headed for Iziyama to meet Chief Leonard Unago. Now, Chief Leonard Unago was said to be a popular businessman too. Uh, a hotelier who also has a hotel, but mostly in Lagos and also not as big as Otokoto Hotel. He also had other businesses. He was also a philanthropist who helps widows and the poor people in his community. Another thing about Chief Leonard Unago is he was the brother of the Prime Minister of science and technology under the General Sani Abacha regime and he had recently been appointed so it was a big thing for his family they were quite popular the spotlight was sort of already on them when innocent Eke Ayamu goes to his house to deliver this human head he wasn't around Sussi said he was in Lagos and this is where I got confused and I was like I don't understand if they are saying this man called Chifotokoto for a human head and Chief Otokoto tells his gardener to kill somebody to go and give to him why was he not there to receive it why was he not in his house or why did he not make arrangements to receive this package this part alone gave me a little bit of doubt that I did not think Chief Leonard was expecting any human head this is a human head we're talking about these are men who are well known they understand the implication of keeping such a thing secret and sensitive and discreet but that was the situation chief leonard was not around to receive the human head package so we understand that innocent K. Anyawu then takes the package and heads for oere presumably back to otokoto hotel however he takes a motorcycle to the park and while he was at the park the bike man a man named opara noticed the plastic bag he was holding and after dropping innocent off went to Hiho police station to report that a man is coming towards this path heading for Oweri and he has a human head in a plastic bag and the police set up their checkpoint started searching every vehicle coming through heading for Oweri and that was where they found innocent Eke Anyamu with the human head he was arrested and taken to Hiho police station now while he was there in, in Hiho police station they saw him with the human head a photographer came takes the picture and innocent Eke Anyamu makes a statement to a police officer named Sunday, I think. Now, this is fresh off the boat. This just happened. The police are discovering this. It's gruesome, it's grisly, it's confusing. They too are confused. Innocent was not beaten, harassed. The people of Oweri have not even heard it. So there was no pandemonium. There was no anger. There was no fury. Innocent Eke Anyamu was as calm as he could. He has been caught. There was nothing left to do than to speak up. So this police officer, Constable Sunday, sits Innocent Eke Anyamu down to take innocent statements. And this is where this story starts to get confusing. In Innocent Eke Anyamu's first statement to the police, he was asked where he killed the boy, why he killed the boy, and who he was going to deliver the head to. An innocent Eke Anyamu confessed that he was going to give this human head to Chief Leonard Onago for ritual purposes. Check. How did he kill the boy? He said he lured the boy and used the machete on the victim. Then they asked him, you know, where he works. He says he worked in Otokoto Hotel as a gardener. Now, the next question is what gets the story confusing. When they asked him where he killed this boy, in his first official statement to the police force, Innocent Eke Anyamu says he killed this boy at Umba River, a river that was so close to Aziyama in Ikeduru already that he killed him by the bank of a river and buried his body near the river. In his first statement, Chief Vincent Duru was not mentioned. Otokoto Hotel was not mentioned. The only person implicated in his first statement was Chief Leonard Hunago, who he was going to give the human head to. And that was where they assumed that it was Chief Leonard Nago who had sent him. So that happened. The picture that was taken of him holding the victim's head was then publicized on newspapers and even showed on television 
because the police, according to them, thought that this would help them identify the victim. Hopefully, families of the victim would see it on the newspaper and on, and on the news and they will come forward to, you know, do the necessary arrangements. That was the in initial plan of the... That was what they thought. But that was a very big mistake because when this picture went viral, and by viral, I don't mean Facebook viral. Back then in 1996, by viral, it was everywhere on the newspaper and on the news and on the television and on the radio. So when this news went viral that a young man has been caught with a human head, people of Oweri blew up steam. They were angry and furious. But they did not react just yet. They kept following the story. Now the story has broken out. People knew that it was in Hero Police Station, so they had to take Innocent Eke Ayanwu to Oweri Police Station and a detective by the name of Officer Obasi Chuku was then assigned the case to investigate and find out what happened. Guys, this man, Officer Obasi Chuku, is the man who would make or break this case. He is the man who is about to change everything you thought you knew about the story. This was the man that made me doubt basically everything I thought I knew about the Otokoto story. Obasi Chuku is the reason why the Otokoto story is what it is and is also the reason why it shouldn't be what it is. So, Innocent Eke Ayanwu goes to Oweri Police Station and Obasi Chuku, the detective in charge of this case, picks up his statement that he made in Hiho Police Station. He reads it, but he's not very satisfied with it. You know he has already learned of it. So when they learn of this story, they usually come up with their own deduction in their head. That is what most detectives do. They just assume and follow their assumption. However, there are claims that Officer Obasi Chuku, upon hearing that this boy was killed in Umba River, took his men to Umba River to look for the body of the granite seller. But they did not find it. However, this is my problem. They did not go with Innocent A.K. Ayaun. They went by themselves. This, to me, was suspicious. Nowadays, when you see policemen take criminals to the place where they commit the crime, it makes sense. They catch a criminal. The criminal will be the one to lead the officers to where they kill their victims and show the officers how they do it. I always feel like this is a protocol. The criminal is in handcuffs leading the officers to where he killed and buried their victims. But in the case of Innocent A.K. Ayamu, he was left in the police station. After telling them he killed the boy in Umba River, the officer, Officer Obasi, and two other people, about three, two other people followed him to Umba River to go and look for the body. And I'm like, I don't know how Umba River is, but if it's a river, then it's going to be big. And if this is 1996, it was most likely bigger then. So how were they expecting to find where this boy's body was buried without the person who did the killing? So Officer Obasi comes back to the police station and tells Innocent, boy, we didn't see the body there. And so, Innocent Eke Ayanwu was forced to make a second statement. And this is where everything changes. Now, I want you to put two things in mind that might be slightly suspicious. The first thing is, Innocent Eke Ayanwu was illiterate. Or should I say he was an illiterate man. He could not speak English, nor could he read and write. He could only speak Igbo. In his first statement, it was Officer Sunday who wrote it for him. In translation, Innocent would speak in Igbo what he did and the officer would write. So when he came to Oweri police station, Officer Obasi did not like the first statement and of ordered him to make a second one. Or maybe it was protocol that when you change police station, you make a new statement. I don't know how it was in 1996. So in this second statement, Innocent speaks in Igbo again and Obasi writes. The only problem with this second statement is suddenly chief otokoto's name was mentioned suddenly the otokoto hotel was mentioned suddenly the boy was no longer killed at umba river he was killed at otokoto hotel and this was the statement obasi used and needed to infiltrate the otokoto hotel when innocent made that statement obasi picked it up got a warrant from the judge and marched straight to the otokoto hotel premises this was around the 21st and 22nd of September. Now, this killing of Anthony Kechuko happened on the 19th of September, where he was caught and arrested. He was transferred to a police station, most likely on the 21st or on the 22nd. 
Now, around the 22nd and on the 23rd was when the Otokoto Hotel was most possibly stormed by the police officers. And while they were there, everybody was arrested. Chief Vincent Duru, Ebenezer, he's a hotel manager. Somehow, somehow, Rufus, the guy in charge of his pharmaceutical house, was there at the hotel. And other of his managers, probably his lawyer and some of his boys, who were, you know, his errand boys, were all arrested, including the gate man and, the, and another gardener who assisted innocent in gardening was taken to. The assistant gardener was named Alban Ajebo. So this was um, Innocent Ekeanyan who was assistant gardener in the Otokoto Hotel. All of these people were picked up by the police. The hotel was shut down. Everybody lodged at the hotel was evacuated. All three buildings was emptied and the hotel was seized by the police. The hotel was sealed. Put this in mind. The hotel was empty. The building was evacuated. Nobody was there, apparently. After the hotel was evacuated, only one police officer stayed back in the hotel. Only one police officer was at that building. It could have been two police officers, but the claim was only one police officer remained in the Otokoto Hotel after everywhere was cleared. And that police officer was Officer Obasi Chuku. He's the detective. So we are assuming that while he was at the hotel, he was snooping around, trying to find the room where this boy was killed. We're assuming that he was apparently looking for the boy's body, per se. And interestingly so, he found the body of the granot cellar, buried at the backyard of the Otokoto Hotel. And where he was buried was very close to the room of the gardener, Innocent Eke Anyamu and Aban Ajebo, where the gardener stayed. And that was when this officer, Officer Obasichuku, calls other police officers at the Owe police station and tells them and informs them that he has found the body of the boy. You guys should please come to the hotel right now and come with Innocent Eke Anyamu. This is the second time he is going to look for the body without the actual killer. If in the boy's second statement he eventually confesses that he killed the victim at the Tokoto hotel what stopped him from picking up Eke Ayanwu back to go and look for the body with other people and with other press however it was said that it was this officer that found the body all by himself and after he found the body he called the police officer to bring Innocent Eke Anyamu and to bring Chief Otokoto as well as other people who were arrested, including the receptionist. And so they were all brought back in handcuffs and the body of the victim was seen dug out from a shallow grave at the backyard. And Innocent Eke Anyamu was made to take a picture next to it. And by this time, the Granot Cellar's family had been involved. The boy's uncle a man named Jonathan showed up and identified the boy to be his nephew. And from then on, it was believed that Innocent Eke Ayamu took this boy to the backyard of the hotel, the gardener's room, to where he and the other menial workers slept. That was where he did the killing. So according to court documents, the killing happened not in the main hotel room, but at the backyard of the hotel that Innocent lured the boy, deceived him, took him to his lodge at the back of the hotel where the killing happened and where he eventually takes the body into the bush that was next to it to bury before taking the head and heading for Iziyama. And this became the narrative. And when the boy's body was found, the people of Uri learned about it and they were furious. The narrative became that Chief Vincent Duru the popular wealthy businessman was the one who sent his gardener to kill this boy to give to another wealthy businessman named Leonard Onagu. And this was when the people of Ore figured out and concluded and eventually felt vindicated that finally what we thought is true. These rich men and these rich people coming out of nowhere are all money ritualists. This is what they do to make their money. The anger was brewing, the picture was already tormenting enough, and they were waiting for the police to do justice to this case. They were waiting for the case to go to court. Innocent Eke Ayanwu 
went from being a killer to being a victim of circumstances. People started thinking that he was forced to do it because he's a poor boy. He was made to do it. It was this rich man that put him up to it and that he was going to expose all the rich men who are into body parts dealing in the courts when this case eventually goes to court, which it was scheduled to. Unfortunately, four days after he was arrested, a day after he was taken back to the Otokoto Hotel to snap a photo of himself with the boy's recovered body. The next day, around the 23rd and 24th of September, 1996, Innocent Eke Ayawu was found dead, murdered in his cell at the police station. And when he was found murdered in his cell at the police station, Officer Basi quickly checked on it and let the whole world knew that this boy had been poisoned, that somebody poisoned and killed him, that the food brought to him to eat was poisoned, creating the narrative that the rich men who were about to be exposed wanted to silence this boy for life. They wanted to keep him shut. They knew he had the secret of this man in his palm and they wanted to shut him up because if he goes to court, he will spill, confess, and everybody will go down. That was why they poisoned him. And after the news of Innocent King Anyao being poisoned, the people of Oweri had enough. The protest started. The people went to the streets. Rich men were targeted. Their businesses were targeted. Supermarkets, hotels. The people of Oweri divided themselves into factions. Some people targeted certain rich men, even those rich men who were not even directed, directly connected. Rich men who they have always suspected were attacked. If you're a wealthy man or you're a known man or you're a pastor that somebody have in the past suspected you of being a money ritualist, they came for you. The riot was more like the poor versus the rich. The angry youths looted supermarkets, looted boutiques. Cars were burnt, broken into hotels that were owned by businessmen whose wealth were questionable was attacked. Anybody whose source of wealth was not known by the public was attacked. The riot was unstoppable. It took the intervention of the military men to calm this riot down. And while this riot was going on, everybody was furious at the fact of what had just happened. At this point, the whole city of Oweri was screaming, born Otokoto. They did not want to hear. He did this, kill Leonard Onago. This rich man did this. They made this poor gardener do this to another poor granite seller. So therefore, they should be treated as killers. Eventually, the case was charged to court. And the Otokoto 7, including Chief Leonard, Chief Vincent Duru, Ebenezer, uh, Otokoto Hotel Manager Rufus, Otokoto Pharmaceutical Manager Lawrence, one of Otokoto's boys, Alban, the assistant gardener, and one man who was also the security at the Otokoto Hotel. All of these people were taken. The only one person who was not involved was the receptionist at the Otokoto Hotel. The young woman at the time was not included because it was eventually discovered that the victim, the granite seller, was sneaked to the back. So he was never brought to the reception because the first story that claimed the granite seller was taken to the reception would have implicated the receptionist because she should have seen it. And if she had seen the boy get drugged and taken upstairs to a room, then she too would be implicated. But she wasn't implicated because it is the narrative that came up that the killing happened at the backyard of the hotel. And so she was somehow not included. Another thing too was there's a chance and possibility that the receptionist may have gotten a deal. I'm sorry to say this is my opinion. She too may have gotten a deal to testify against Chief Otokoto because she did so on the day where the court's proceedings were taking place. She was one of the few people who came to testify against Chief Otokoto and it was part of her testimony that helped convict Chief Otokoto and other people in the death of Antoni Ikechuku. So I would see why she was not involved, even though she was one of the people picked and arrested at the hotel at the initial time. She most likely got a good deal and was told to testify against him and 
To be fair though, her testimony was not a lie. We'll come to her testimony later. Her testimony was not a lie. She said everything she knew and she kept it at that. So it was left for the judge to do whatever they wanted to do from her testimony. She said what she saw and she said what she knew and she left it at that. So it wasn't like she was hired to lie against Shifotokoto. What she said was the truth. I, I can agree to that. And what she said was what was mostly used to convict every other person in the Otokoto money ritual scandal. But let's come back a bit because something happened right before this case went to court. Right before this case met its final judgment. And guess what happened? Officer Obasichuku, the detective in charge of this case, was convicted and sentenced to death. Just before the Otokoto trial began, Officer Obasichuku was arrested for a big crime that he and his boys committed. Not only that, they were taken to court, tried, and found guilty, and then sentenced to death. How on earth is the man whose job it is to find justice for Antoni Ikechuku and for the people of Oere end up being the one sentenced to death for a big crime that he committed? What did this man possibly do to land him in jail that he had to be sentenced to death first way before Otokoto was sentenced to death. Drum roll please. It turned out that Officer Obasichuku was the one who killed Innocent A.K. Anyangu. You see, Innocent A.K. Anyangu was never poisoned to death. After the news of his death made headlights, everybody thought it was Chief Otokoto, Chief Leonard, and host of other rich men in a black scorpion cult that tried to get him killed in order to silence him from exposing them from their underground money ritual practices. That was the narrative that is still present till this day. Because not many people remember that Innocent A.K. Anyamu was never poisoned. The narrative was wild spread. It was wild spread. Everybody thought it was Chifotokoto and the Black Scorpion cult group that did this to Innocent A.K. Anyamu. And because of that narrative, because of that suspicion, the state had to investigate the death of Innocent A.K. Ayanwu in the Oweri police station. They needed to know because if they find out whoever poisoned him to death had to do with one of these rich men, then it was going to make the case even harder for Otokoto and the host of the other accused. However, when an autopsy was conducted on the body of Innocent A.K. Ayanwu, they did not see any poison in his system. He did not eat any food that would have killed him. They realized that his death was as a result of strangulation and also being beaten to stupor. Innocent had serious injuries, serious bruises. Innocent was tortured in that Oweri police station and that was ruled as his cause of death. And when the investigation began into who and who may have killed Innocent A.K. Ayamu, all the police officers on duty throughout the time Innocent A.K. Ayamu was in the Oweri police station were arrested including Officer Obasi and his few other guys who were following his orders. They were all taken to court and Officer Obasi and three others were found guilty in the killing of Innocent A.K. Ayanwu. Which begs the question, why did this man want to strangle Innocent A.K. Ayanwu to death? Innocent A.K. Ayanwu is the most important person in this case. He is the one who did the killing of the boy. He is the one who blew this up. Only he could come to the court and tell the whole world what really happened. So, why did Officer Obasi choose to kill the most important man in his case? His most important witness, the persecution most important witness, why did he do it? What was the reason? Was it an accident or was it deliberate? Put in mind that this innocent A.K. Ayamu's death was barely a day after he was taken back to Otokoto Hotel to take a picture with the boy's body that was found. The body in which Innocent A.K. Ayanwu claimed he killed at Umba River. Suddenly, he was dragged to Otokoto Hotel to take a picture with it. Due to the fact that in his second statement, he changed his narrative. Or should I say, it was believed that Innocent A.K. Ayanwu, in his second statement, finally admitted or claimed that the killing was not done at Umba River, but was rather done at Otokoto Hotel's backyard. And this is my question. 
If innocent the king Ayanwu was telling the truth in that his second statement, why would anybody want to beat him to that point that they have to kill him? If that second statement was truly the words of Innocent Eke Anyahu, why would Officer Obasi want him dead? Put in mind, hold on, hold on, hear me out. Put in mind that as at the time they went to Tokoto Hotel to take the pictures of Innocent Eke Anyahu and the boy's recovered body, Innocent Eke Anyahu has already given his statement. He had already given that second statement. He had already provided Officer Obasi with the second statement. So that confession was done. Why then did they need to still kill him? One fact that I believe is that somebody wanted to silence innocent A.K. Ayamu. But it was not Chief Otokoto, nor was it Chief Leonard, nor was it the host of other rich ritualists. It was the person who killed him that wanted to silence him that wanted to shut him up. So what on earth could Officer Obasi want to shut Innocent Eke Anyahu up for? What did Innocent Eke Anyahu know that would have made Officer Obasi Chuku so scared that he needed to keep him shut by killing him? Well, if it's not clear by now, let me paint the picture. Remember, Innocent Eke Ayanwu is illiterate. His first statement at Iho police station was taken down by Officer Sunday. In English, Innocent would say what he did in Igbo, Officer Sunday would write it in English. When he came to Owerri police station, Officer Obasichuku did not like his first statement and made him write a second one. Now, it's going to be the same thing because Innocent would not learn English in less than 24 hours. Innocent sat down, gave his statement in Igbo, while Officer Obasichuku wrote it in English. Now, by right, the statement will be read back to Innocent Eke Ayamu, and he will thumbprint with his signature, claiming that he wrote it. Now, we don't know what went on in the questioning room between Innocent and Officer Obasi. We don't know what the interaction was, but I'm imagining this is 1996, so these officers back then would beat prisoners and criminals and suspects into confessing. Even for a crime that they did not commit, we know that these things used to happen back in the day. But let's assume it happened or it did not happen. The point is, Innocent is telling Officer Obasi his statement in Igbo and Officer Obasi is writing it down. But here is the trick. It's a different story from his first statement. The story Innocent Eke Ayamu pens down, or should I say, the story Officer Obasi pens down as Innocent Eke Ayamu's second statement was different from that of the one Officer Sunday at Iho Police Station penned down on behalf of Innocent Eke Ayamu. And we both know the difference. In the first statement, Otokoto Hotel was not implicated. Chief Otokoto was not mentioned. The killing did not happen at Otokoto Hotel. But suddenly, the big change in the second statement is Chief Otokoto sent him. He did it in Otokoto Hotel. There were even claims that when Officer Obasi went to arrest Chief Otokoto, Chief Otokoto made a statement to him saying, has he implicated me? That claim was taken seriously to mean something. However, when it comes to the second statement of Innocent Eke Ayamu, and when it comes to the motive behind Obasi Chuku, killing him there is only one explanation and that is whether or not innocent could read or write whether or not innocent spoke chinese Igbo, or french he would still get his day in court innocent aka ayam would still be taken to court and in that court he was going to stand and whatever he claimed in his statement would be repeated now if innocent aka ayam yes what he did not say in Igbo in that statement he would say, no, I did not say that. My, my Lord, I did not say this. These were not my words. I did not know what this man wrote because I cannot read. I said it in Igbo and they translated it in English. And if what I'm hearing is what people are saying that I said, then it's not what I said. If Innocent Eke Ayahu had repeated his statement, whatever the truth might be for him, if he had repeated it in the court of law, it would have gone against whatever Officer Obasichuku had penned down for him. It seemed as though Officer Obasichuku was trying to control the narrative. He was trying to play God in this situation. And that may have been his downfall. And that was why he saw Innocent Eke Ayamu as a threat. And that was why 
he needed to eliminate him. Which also begs the question, is the second statement true or false? Which one should we take? Which of these statements seems true? Because right now, the narrative that everybody knows as a Tokoto story is the killing happened in a Tokoto hotel. Now, if this killing truly did not happen in a Tokoto hotel, it means everything we knew about the Otokoto money ritual story was a lie. It means Chief Otokoto had been innocent the whole time. It means the Otokoto seven were falsely accused. Well, except from Leonard Unago, who was the consistent one in both statements, who was painted to be the mastermind. So when it comes to Chief Leonard Unago, let's keep him aside. He was in the first and second statement. He is the constant one in both statements. But Chief Otokoto only showed up in the second statement that suddenly seemed questionable. And I'm confused as to why the second statement was admissible in court. How come the lawyers of the Otokoto 7 accepted that this statement goes into court? Although I read somewhere that they tried to fight against it, that the lawyers of Chief Otokoto questioned the legitimacy of that second statement, of that second so-called confession of innocent A.K. Anyang, who suddenly died after making the confession. And who it turned out that the person who killed him was the same man who took the confession down. This is suspicious. I am sorry to say, when I learned about this part, this was it for me. It was at this point that I stood on serious reasonable doubt that Chief Otokoto was even guilty. The fact that the statement convicting him was retrieved in a sketchy way was written in second hand and the person who took down the statement killed the person who made the statement. If this is not suspicious, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. And I think the biggest downfall when it comes to the Otokoto story is the fact that maybe the lawyers underestimated the power of the people. I don't think many people there knew. Does the crowd of people pressuring the government to send these men to jail was so heavy and their voices were so loud that not many people saw the facts. Not many people cared for the facts. Remember, this was 1996. There wasn't enough internet to go around. The information that Innocent A.K. Ayan was actually not poisoned wasn't as popular as the one that he was poisoned. The information that Officer Obasi was the one who killed Innocent A.K. Ayan wasn't as popular. The fact that the second statement was taken in a questionable way was these details were not there to help the people of Oweri, the angry youths of Oweri, see the disparities in the story. So many of those people agitating for the hanging of Chief Otokoto and the others did not get the memo. Many of them did not hear the other details. Many of them were still fixated at the initial news, at the initial story, at the popular story. That is it. That was what a lot of them knew. And that was what a lot of them held on. And that was where the amount of so much pressure in the judicial system stemmed from. So no matter what the outcome is, no matter what it was, the people of Oweri really wanted to see Otokoto and the rest sentenced to death. Because let's face it, all seven of them could not have played equal roles in the killing of Anthony Ikechuku. They made it seem like they were all in a cult, in a black scorpion cult, and they all, only one person killed him. So even if Chief Otokoto sent Innocent A.K. Ayao, by law, he did not do the killing. Even if he sent somebody, he was not the one who did the initial killing. So by right and by law, his level of involvement in the killing, as long as the level of his hotel manager, as well as the level of his pharmacy manager, the gate man, the other gardener, even Chief Leonard himself, their level of involvement in killing this boy is not the same. So by law, they should all get different sentencing. But what we saw was that the judge sentenced all of them to death. This goes to show you that this case was just something that was, you have to also put in mind that three judges had to step down. They changed judges like three different times because I'm assuming the first two judge saw that, ha, this case get as it look like. And if we don't sentence this man to death, these people of Oweri will not be happy. And I think the people needed a judge to be on their side. Hence, the final judge who took on the case, who did not waste time. She was so brutal. She did not care. The moment she stepped into that court of law, it 
was done for the Otokoto. And it was a woman. So you got to know that she was ready to send these people to hell, regardless of the level of involvement. They may have taken part in the killing of the boy, if indeed it did happen in Otokoto Hotel. You could tell she just wanted to get, get done, get it over with. You could tell she just wanted to do what made the people happy. Because if we are going by law, each and every one person in the Otokoto 7 played a different role. If they did kill him all, because the person who did the stabbing will not get the same punishment as the person who knew about it. But yet, they were all grouped together and all thrown to the electric chair like they all partook in stabbing the boy one by one. And that goes to show you that even till the end of this case, the people of Oweri were still furious and angry and they needed that justice. But nothing changes the fact that the second statement that sentenced everyone to death was recovered or was retrieved or was penned down in the most sketchy way ever in criminal history. And the person who did the penning down ended up getting his own day in court and ended up being sentenced to death. Maybe karma is real or maybe God does work in mysterious ways. Innocent was the only one who had the truth. And the truth, in my opinion, was in his very first statement. And I want to believe that his second statement was something that was forced on him. I want to believe that when he was even taken to Otokoto Hotel to take a picture with the body, he was confused as to how the body got to Otokoto Hotel. Because in his first statement, he killed that boy in Umba River and buried him there. So when the police went there to find the body, they didn't see it. But he was not taken with the police to go and look for the body. Now, he doesn't take care of illiterate. So I can see why Obasichuku thought he could get away with this. I can see why Obasichuku thought he could use this boy to create a narrative that he wanted to pass. If Innocent Eke Ayanwu was actually saying what he knew, was actually saying what Officer Obasi wanted to hear, why would he be beaten, tortured and killed and strangled? If Innocent was a good tool in the court of law, Obasi Chuku would not have killed him or tortured him the way he did. The only person who wanted Innocent to be quiet was Officer Obasi Chuku because Innocent was keen to his very first statement. Innocent was on his own shocked that Otokoto was somehow included in the statement. Remember, Innocent cannot read. He cannot write. When he was making his confessions in Igbo, Obasichuku was the one writing it. And he would give it to him to sign. And Innocent signed, not knowing what was translated, not knowing what was written in English. But the fact was, and the truth is, when it goes to court, Innocent would be put on the stand. And whether he speaks Igbo, Chinese or French, the communication would happen. And he would be eventually asked over and over again, where did you kill this boy? If he repeats that it's Umba River, it will go against the statement that Officer Obasi had written, which would make Obasi a liar and which would eventually save the lives of Chief Otokoto and the rest people who were convicted. So it was one or two things. Keep Innocent alive to go to court and say his first version of the statement or kill him and claim to the whole world that this second statement was the actual statement he made before he died. And that was where Obasichuku was caught. That was where everything relating to Obasichuku felt fraudulent. I somehow started having doubts when I learned that this was what happened to Obasichuku and Innocent Eke Ayamu. This was where, to me, I started seeing certain disparities in the Otokoto story. The fact that the officers went to the river alone and the fact that it was only Obasichuku that was at the Otokoto Hotel when the victim's body was found. There were now claims and there were other narratives. People who started hearing about this at the time in Owori started thinking. Many of them started suspecting. This is not a new narrative. Oh. This was there at the time. There were a small faction of people who were maybe educated and who were you know, who, you know, who were following the case back to back, they started seeing these disparities and they started asking questions. The suspicion was now like this officer went to Umba River, saw the body, waited for the perfect time, cleared the hotel in Otokoto, went back to Umba River, carried the body, 
to plant it in Otokoto Hotel and then call the police to bring the boy, call the police to bring Chief Otokoto to let them know that, see, we found the boy at the back of your hotel. And everybody was confused as to how this boy got there. This was brought up in court, but the judge dismissed it. The judge was like, nobody would have done it, that it did not make sense. She did not believe that anybody would have carried the boy's body through the fence into the Otokoto Hotel. But what she did not see was that it was the police officer who would have done it. He was now the one in charge of the hotel. He had cleared everywhere. And to me, whether anyone agrees or not, that claim holds water. Given what happened to Officer Obasi in the end, the fact that Obasi had to suffer and even lose his life in the process of bringing this man down shows that his hands weren't clean. There is something about the way Officer Obasi Chuku handled the case that seemed very sketchy. That makes me rethink everything I thought I knew about the Otokoto money rituals. But this is the thing. Let's assume something. Let's assume Chief Otokoto, in Innocent's first statement, was Innocent, per se. The killing did not happen at his hotel. He was not the one who sent Innocent. One thing that was for a fact was Innocent A.K. Anya was taking that head to Chief Leonard Unago. And Chief Leonard Unago was implicated both in the first and in the second statement, which kind of makes him the master head of this money ritual thing, which kind of makes him the one, the king of it all. Now, Chief Leonard Unago in court was eventually asked about his relationship with Innocent A.K. Ayawo, and he says he does not know this boy. They also asked him about his relationship with Chief Vincent Duru. They said they did not know each other, but the judge did not believe them. The judge cited that they were both chiefs in Ike Duru, so they should know each other. And I have a problem with that narrative. I'm sorry. I know the judge was in her element when she was, you know, judging this case, but just because two men are chiefs from the same Ike Duru community, Ike Duru community is very big old. Ikeduru community is like Oweri itself. There is Oweri, there is Ikeduru. It's like saying two prominent chiefs in Potakot must know each other. That is what this judge is claiming. That since Otokoto is a chief in Ikeduru and Leonardo Nago is a chief in Ikeduru, then they know each other. To be fair to, be fair to the judge, I see her line of argument. They are actually prominent chiefs. Otokoto is a big name. Leonardo Nago is a big name. So... When you look at it, I can agree that, yeah, there's a part that they must or they might have known of each other. Because two famous people would know of each other. That doesn't mean two famous people know each other. That doesn't mean the two people know each other. So, but the judge believes that the fact that they know that two chiefs from the same community, then they know each other, which makes the claim that one sent the other one human head possible. That is how the judge made that deduction. But when it comes to Leonardo Nago, I did a little digging because my question is, wait, if this boy was not sent by Leonardo Nago to kill somebody and bring the head, why then would he do it? Why would he do it and then take it to Leonardo Nago? There was something the judge said that I agreed with. It was a very good question. She said, why was it Leonardo Nago of all people? That there is no how this boy will kill somebody and carry a human head and go straight to Leonardo Nago's house without them being a prior arrangement. Let's assume Otokoto did not send this boy because we've understood that that narrative of the body being, you know, placed in Otokoto kind of holds a little bit of water. Let's focus on Innocent A.K. Anyahu now and Chief Leonard. Why Leonard? Of everybody in Eziyama, of all the notable men, Nikeduro, why was he Chief Leonard? And why is Chief Leonard saying he does not know this boy? I got to learn that Innocent A.K. Ayanwo was related to Chief Leonard Nago. He was his uncle from his maternal side. This is a discovery that is not very confirmed, but it's a shocking thing to me. And when I thought about it, oh, this would make sense. If he is his uncle, then they know each other or at least know of each other. Or since he was a more prominent one, he knows him. If it's his mother's cousin, they, they know of each other, which will make it a lot more difficult for Leonard Nago to get out of this. But he didn't come up in court. Leonard denied him. And I think maybe Leonard knew that this boy is his relative, but admitting to it would only implicate him further. But why then did this boy take the head there? 
did Leonard really send him? That we would never know. That is something only innocent Ike Ayamu would tell us. But he is not here to do it. He didn't get a chance to get his day in court. The truth never came out. The only thing that we know of innocent Ike Ayamu was the two statements he left behind, written and translated to English by two different policemen that have two different stories in it. Those are the only thing this boy left. He never got his day in court. He was killed before then. So now we would never know why Chief Leonard Onago. Let's assume you killed this boy in Umba River. Why was it Chief Leonard Onago? And the only thing that I can say in defense of Chief Leonard Onago was that he was not home. So if he was expecting a human head, he would have been home. But he wasn't home. This is the only thing that kind of makes him a little bit innocent. This is the only thing that makes him a little bit not particularly guilty in my opinion this is the only thing that gives reasonable doubt beyond reasonable doubt that there is probably a chance that this man did not send this boy now this is another thing again too that was eventually revealed or that i got to learn when learning of the story after innocent went to leonard's house and wanted to deliver the head and got to learn that Chief Leonard was not around, that he had traveled to Lagos, he did not go straight to Oweri. He went to his mother's house because he too was from that community. So he went to meet his mother and went to his mother's house and was maybe hoping to stay there till Chief Leonard gets back. So he was there with the human head. You have to understand that this human head, he could not just throw it away. It was important to him. I don't know, maybe this was his road or he was hoping to get rich from it. I don't know. Remember, he is illiterate, so I don't know what was in his illiterate head. But they said, or there is the narrative, or there's a story that said he went to his mother's house to see his family. And while he was at his mother's house, his mother, that is Innocent Ekeanyangu's mother, saw the bag, saw the head, and told him to leave. The mother was like, you better take that thing out of my house. This kind of makes me feel like maybe it's a consensus. Maybe it's a discussion that the family have had. Maybe they've gossiped about Chief Leonard Nago. Maybe they know about his ways. I am not sure. Maybe they know about certain things he did. It could have been rumors. It could have been true. And when they saw their son do it, they were like, nah. Nah, get out from here. And Innocent Ekeyang was kicked out of his house by his mother. Even the bike man opera was also related to Innocent Ike Ayamu. Uh, we're hearing that it was the mother that called the bike man to take him to the park or something. So when the bike man took him, they probably whispered in his ear that that was what he had done and that was where he learned it from. It was also said that the bag itself was leaking of um, fluids. So that was where the man would have confirmed that what was in that bag was a human part. And that was how Innocent was on his way. Most likely entered a Volvo because most articles at the time kept saying he was found in a Volvo. But that Volvo discussion, it could not have been true because they're trying to paint it as though it was a rich man's car he was in doing this delivery. But that's not the truth. That Volvo could have been a taxi. But then Volvo was a big car, so I don't think it was a taxi. Narrative, some people are saying he was in a bus. Some said he was in a Volvo. Some said he was in a bike. But what we know is that he took the bike to the park. And in that park, he was supposed to take a vehicle to Oweri. So we don't know if it was a bus or a Volvo. But most modern day narrative of the story is trying to make it look like he was in a Volvo, a flashy vehicle. Because they wanted to make it seem as though since it was two rich men that sent him, that was how they transported it. Which we would now talk about. Let's reason this. And this was something that came to my mind. Chief Otokoto is a very educated man, rich, wealthy, and had multiple people at his beck and call. Same with Chief Leonardo Nago. These men have multiple vehicles. If they were into human part trafficking, why would they send a gardener? Why would they send an illiterate man who can't speak English? And even if they want to send that gardener, why would they put him on an okada and put the head in waterproof? There was just something about this narrative or this line of thought that made me feel like something is not right here. Is it that Chief Otokoto is stupid or illiterate too? Or this was his first time doing this? Because the way the killing and the transporting of this 
situation was, seemed a little too amateur. If these two men, Chief Otokoto and Chief Leonardo Nagu, have been in the business of money ritual and human part trafficking, they would have a method. They would have a way they do it. They would have a system that works. Remember, Otokoto Hotel has been in existence for 30 years. So if they are claiming that this man has been doing this for that long and he has been getting away for 30 years, then he has a channel. And I don't think that channel is a gardener at his backyard when he has multiple people who could enter a convoy to go and transport that human head. This line of thought makes sense to me. I don't want to know what anyone else thinks because to me, it's questionable that two rich businessmen want to do, let's assume that they are both ritualists. They will send a gardener, an illiterate gardener. Even if they wanted to send him, they will allow him jump bike, jump okada. They will put the human head in waterproof that has holes and is leaking. Ah, this is, it, it doesn't make sense. Maybe these men were probably, their hands were unclean. I'm just saying that maybe they are ritualists. But when it comes to the killing of Anthony Ikechuku, there's something that doesn't sit well with me. It feels to me that Innocent A.K. Ayamu acted on his own accord. It doesn't seem to me that this man sent him. Maybe Innocent knows that they deal with this thing and he wanted to get involved. But the thing is, if these men are into it, they would do it in a way where nobody would know. Like the way they would have been doing it for all these years. And there's also a chance that Chief Otokoto does not even know Innocent. He did not hire him. He may have seen the gardeners, spoken to them once a while, but he was not the one in charge of hiring and firing anybody in his hotel. Ebeniza, his manager, was. But we are made to believe that Otokoto was the one who gave the orders to innocent to do the killing and that was where otokoto got implicated in the second statement and while in court margaret the receptionist made a statement in court when they asked she said they asked her was otokoto was shifutokoto at the hotel the day the killing happened and margaret said yes he was there and this was actually what the judge used the fact that Chief Vincent Duru was in his hotel room when the killing was happening downstairs in the backyard shows that he was the one who sent him. This is the deduction and this was what the judge said. So the only thing right now that implicated Chief Otokoto that made him be sentenced to death was he was in the hotel building when the killing was happening and he was a chief in Ikeduru who knew Chief Leonard Onago since they were both chiefs. In Ikedru. And those are the only two things that the judge used to sentence this man and the rest of them to death. This was what she used and concluded that they killed the boy. And to me, I'm sorry, it's not a very strong narrative. I don't think that was strong. It just leaves, there's just too many rooms for reasonable doubt here. I feel like everybody involved or accused in the killing of Anthony Ikechuku were doomed the moment Innocent Eke Ayamu, the man who actually did the killing, died. Because only he would have said the truth. Only he would have said, if he had come to court and he had mentioned Otokoto, that would have been the truth. If he had come to court and he had mentioned Leonardo Nagu, that would have been the truth. But he never got the day in court. And the two statements the claim he made was translated into English by one officer who did not use force on him and by a second officer who killed him and unfortunately it was the statement taken by the second officer that was used to conclude and sentence everyone involved to death why did they even use the statement of officer Obasi when he was on death row when he was already locked up in jail for killing the person who made the statement there was also something about that statement that should not have been ad uh, admissible in court that should not have been used in court. That second statement to me was what killed Chief Otokoto. And the way it was gotten feels like it was a setup. There was too many problems with that second statement that should not have been used. For some weird reason, it was admissible and it was used in court and it was used to determine that everybody was guilty. But there is one more thing that makes it even worse. There is something else that I discovered that I think makes me even believe furthermore that Innocent Eke Ayamu 
did not kill this boy in Otokoto Hotel. That he indeed, according to his first statement, killed him in Umba River. And this will shock you too. Now, there is one more thing that makes this story even weirder, making me believe in the very first statement of Innocent aka Ayamu, where he said he killed this boy in Umba River. I had my doubts. Somewhere in my mind, I felt maybe he was trying to protect the Tokoto Hotel, he was hoping he doesn't get to his work, you know, maybe he was afraid of implicating the Tokoto Hotel. Maybe. But I was now like, okay, if he's saying he killed this boy in Umba River, and the detective officer Basi, he's saying he killed him at Otokoto Hotel. I wanted to know where this boy lived. I wanted to know where he lived to determine which place would have been more possible for him to have been killed at. Now, Anthony Ikechuku, as a, as a young boy, lost his father. And as the first son of six or seven children, thereabouts, he and his mother had to leave their paternal home because of the poor treatment from his uncles from his father's side. So his mother, Miss Felicia, took her children back to her own father's house. I think in Imbise, I'm not sure of their hometown. So she takes herself and her children, including Anthony Ikechuku, back to her father's house because she could no longer take the bad treatment from her in-laws. So when she goes to her mother's, uh, to her father's side, she's welcomed by her mother. She's there, everybody welcomes her. She has been through hell in her marriage and in her husband's family hands. But now she doesn't have any work. She can't take care of her children by herself. She has to find a way to make it easier on her. Her brother, most possibly her younger brother, a man named Jonathan, who is a, a, a tailor, a fashion designer, comes to the village and offers to take Anthony Ikechuku to the town, to Oweri. And so, she was grateful. She tells Anthony, see, you're going to stay with your uncle in Oweri, you go to school there, and you help out, you know, in their day-to-day -day activities. Anthony is taken to Oweri to live with his uncle, Jonathan, where he helps the uncle's wife hawk bald granites around their neighborhood. I always wondered, where did the uncle stay in Oweri, and how close is their house to the Otokoto Hotel? Otokoto Hotel is supposed to be at Douglas Road, present-day Douglas Road. So I wanted to know the proximity to understand if Anthony Ikechuku would have been easily killed at Otokoto Hotel or at the Umba River. And I checked the Umba River, and Umba River was far away from Otokoto Hotel. Umba River was somehow a little bit away from Oweri Sef for somewhere. It was away from the Oweri town itself. It was heading towards the Ikeduru side. So these are two distinct places. If Innocent King Ayao had killed this boy at Umba River, it's one place. If he had killed this boy at Otokote Hotel, it's two distinct places. This is 11 kilometers apart. So if Anthony Ikechuku stayed in Oweri town with his uncle, then it is most likely possible that the killing happened at Otokoto Hotel. But I found out that Anthony Ikechuku did not live in Oweri town. He lived with his uncle in Amakoya, a community in Ikeduru, close to Oweri, but about 10 kilometers away from Oweri. This Amakoya is not Oweri for what is worth. Is one of those places nearer to the big city. And that was where Ikechuku lived with his uncle. And that was where Ikechuku most likely hawked his granite around. Because I don't picture this boy trekking 11 kilometers to Douglas Road to go and hawk granite. So if he was hawking granite, he was most likely hawking the granite around Amakoya. And guess where is very close to Amakoya? Umba River. The Umba River is three kilometers away from where Ikechuku Antoni lived with his uncle. And this was where it dawned on me that there is a high chance that this boy was killed at Umba River because his uncle lived in Amakoya in Ikeduru. And Umba River is three kilometers away from Amakoya. Both Amakoya and Umba River are almost 11 to 15 kilometers away from Otokoto Hotel. So did Innocent Eke Ayamu carry this boy all the way from Amakoya in a bike or in a bus or trekked and take him to go and kill him in, in Otokoto Hotel? 
Or is it more possible that he lured him to a secluded place in the river to do the killing? This was where in my mind I'm like, the proximity to the possibility of whether or not he was killed in Umba River or Tokoto Hotel seemed to lean towards Umba River, given that this boy lived with his uncle, went to school in Amakoya, which is three kilometers away from Umba River, and which is 11 kilometers away from Otokoto Hotel. And this was where I concluded to myself that I now believe in his first statement. He most likely killed this boy in Umba River. Another thing again that I observed and I noticed is in the entire court proceedings, even the receptionist did not recall seeing this boy enter the compound. The gate man had no memory of seeing this granite cellar being lured or smuggled into the Otokoto Hotel. Nobody saw Innocent A.K. Ayanwu carry this boy into the hotel. It was never mentioned. It was never brought up. Nobody saw it happen. The only place it existed was in the second statement. It wasn't even in the first statement. Now, the only thing that the receptionist Margaret said she saw was she saw Innocent A.K. Ayanwu leaving the hotel compound with a plastic bag. That was it. Now, the manager, Ebenezer, also record seeing Innocent in the morning and in the evening. Leaving the hotel. Just around the same time, Margaret saw. And they saw him leaving with a plastic bag. But the plastic bag they saw him leaving with was not certain what was in it. They could not tell what was in it. But they saw the granite cellar coming to the hotel. And the Otokoto Hotel was said to have had a strict rule to prevent hawkers. People selling and hawking don't come to the hotel. So that was prohibited. So there was no way that would have happened without it being a situation. At least a little bit. Somebody would have been like, innocent, why are you bringing this boy in? And you know a guy does not like it and he's around. So aside from the second statement, no other record had it that somebody saw innocent bring this boy to Otokoto Hotel. And I assume that since everyone else who should have seen it were also arrested and locked up, they too had to come up with their own defense to rid themselves of the situation. Like the assistant gardener who also shared a room with Innocent claimed he didn't sleep in that room that day. And the judge picked it from there that the reason why he didn't sleep in that room that day was because he knew what was happening in that room. He knew that there was a spirit there and somebody had been killed there. That was why he slept in the gate man's house. If he had said he slept in that room and he did not see anything, that would have really implicated him badly because the detectives, the investigation, concluded that the killing happened in that room and the body was buried in the backyard. So it was important when you're defending yourself, when you're under this serious case like this, to lie and find your way out of it. And guess what? Alban Ajebu was eventually released. There were two people released from the Otokoto saga, there were two people who were eventually found not guilty, who later on in life set free. Alban, the assistant gardener, was released. Ebenezer, Otokoto's manager, was eventually released. These two people got out of the old situation years later, about 13 to 15 years later, not very far back. So they they were eventually, they got their freedom because there was lack of evidence. So if there was lack of evidence, now, that means there was lack of evidence then, in my opinion. If this guy, you sentenced him because he shared a room with the alleged killer, and many years later you find out that he's innocent, it means that there's a possibility that not only was he innocent, I'm sure that there is something wrong with the case as a whole. I don't believe Anthony Ikechuku was hawking granite from Amakoya to Douglas Road, where he was lured into the hotel. It's a long distance to hawk boiled granites, even in 1996. And I don't think his uncle or his auntie would let him do that journey. So I'm sure he was limited to his neighborhood, which for some interesting reason was very close to the Umba River. And guess where else it was close to? I forgot to put this, but let me say it now. Amakoya is not very far from Eziyama in Ikeduru. And it's not also far from Innocent Ekeayanwu's family home. So all of these places, Umba River, where uh, Innocent A.K. Ayanwu allegedly or claimed he did the killing, Amakoya, where the victim, Anthony Ikechuku, lived, Eziyama, where Chief Leonard Onago lived, and Iho, 
where he was caught and arrested, along with where innocent A.K. Ayan lived with his family. All of these places were a lot closer to each other. The only place that is far from all five of these villages or communities is Otokoto Hotel. Otokoto Hotel is, the, is in the main heart of Oweri, is in the bigger side of it. It was, it, it's not even close to any of these places, it's far from it. You have to take about a 20 minute ride to get to Otokoto Hotel from all of these places that has been mentioned. The Umba River is so close to Eziyama, so close to Amakoya, so close to Iho Police Station. All of these places were close, so close to the innocent Eke Ayamu's family home. These places were close together, which it would make sense to me that innocent most likely did the killing in Umba River and not in Otokoto Hotel. So the question is, how did the boy's body end up in Otokoto Hotel? How did it get there? Is it really true that the police officer carried it from there to Tokoto Hotel? And if that's the case, what was his motive? What was his motive? Why would he want to do that? We didn't get to understand the reason. Because even if right now I want to say that maybe Officer Obasi was sketchy and trying to set up Chief Otokoto to make his narrative make sense, it would be nice to have a motive. Do they have a past? Do they have a history? Was there a reason why Officer Obasi would want to bring Chief Otokoto and Chief Leonard down? But when it comes to Chief Leonard, I, I don't think it was up to Officer Obasi because that one was already implicated in the first statement. So why was it important for Obasi to want to bring down Otokoto? You also have to understand again that the atmosphere in Oweri was the rich were suspicious. The rich versus the poor. These big men that are having enormous wealth are getting it illegally. So many people had that mentality. Is it possible that Officer Obasi had that mentality and wanted to prove strongly that Otokoto was a ritualist? Did he have that discussion with somebody? Was there a bet somewhere? Like, what was the reason? The only thing I could find regarding Officer Obasi's motive was something that I think doesn't exactly look good when it comes to Chief Vincent Duru. There was something about it that makes me feel like even if now I believe he may not be directly linked to the killing of Anthony Ikechuko the Granot Seller, his hands may not have been cleaned also. I'm not calling him a criminal or anything, but his son, a young man named Obidiozo Duru, was a very known kidnapper, was a notorious criminal and this is where things changes for this is this is where i came back because at the initial time i was like ah oh, this man is a ritualist then i learned of officer bass and i'm like oh this man might be innocent then i learned of his son obidio zoduru and i'm like oh wait <laughs> this man might not be that innocent so chief Otokoto has a son named obidio zoduru let's call him ozo and ozo even before his father was sentenced to death was equally also sentenced to death. In fact, his son was sentenced to death before Otokoto. Otokoto's sentencing was in 2003. Officer Basichuku's sentencing was probably 1999 or 2000. The son also was sentenced to, to death. And I was like, what did his son do? Apparently, the son was not exactly directed to the killing of Anthony Kejuku. The son had been on the police radar for a very long time. You know, there was a lot of kidnapping happening over at the time. And so the police were already investigating all of those things. And many times it is believed that Obidiozo may have been arrested on suspicion of being involved in kidnapping, but the police never had any concrete proof. And so his father, Chief Vincent Duru, that is Chief, Oto Chief Otokoto, would use his influence, would use his money to maybe bail his son out or get the case thrown away. And I think this is where Officer Obasi Chuku's hatred or target for Chief Otokoto came from. And I think this is where it was important for him to frame this man for this ritual so he could get to his son finally. This is all making sense to me. This is what I could deduct because it was confirmed that Obidioza was a notorious kidnapper. And in my mind, I'm like, who taught him that? If your father is so wealthy and rich, 
why are you kidnapping? Is it possible that Otokoto was also involved in all of this kidnapping? Could it be how he got some of his money? Was he also working with his son? Was his son also cutting some checks for him? And you know these kidnappers targeted rich people. And who would know a rich person other than another rich person? Is it possible that his father was fearing him and telling him who to kidnap and who not to kidnap? And how to get this information about who's rich person to kidnap? Because let me tell you, kidnappers are very wealthy people. And they make a lot of money from it. And they target their, their, their victims very meticulously. So the fact that Chief Otokoto's son, Obi Diozo, was a known notorious kidnapper who had been on the police radar for so long, but his father's influence had been getting him in and out of prison once once, makes me believe that that could be the reason why a police officer would want to put a target on the back of Chief Otokoto. It's like a game of chess. Get rid of the queen so we can get the king. They really wanted to get Ozo. They wanted to get that kidnapper. That was a very big problem. But they most likely could not pin it to him. They could not get him because his father's influence was there. And now a gardener who works in his father's hotel has been caught with a human head. And I'm thinking of his Basi was like, this is a perfect time. Set this man up, bring him down, lock him up and go for his son. Now that Otokoto is in prison, nobody will protect Ozo again. He would now be locked up and arrested for kidnapping. And that was what happened. A year or two after Chief Otokoto was locked up for the killing of Antoni Ikechuku, his son was picked up and arrested and charged with kidnapping and was eventually found guilty and sentenced to death long before his father. And I think this to me is the only explanation and the only reason why I would assume Officer Obasi really wanted to bring Chief Otokoto down. And that was why if there is a claim that the body of the granite cellar was planted in Otokoto Hotel, I don't doubt it. Like I've said, there have been many reasons here beyond reasonable doubt that makes me believe that that could be the case. And if nothing, if you're a spiritual person or you're a Christian, you have to believe something that God has a way of punishing evil people. If Obasi's hand was so clean in this Otokoto case, he would not have lost his life in the process. He would not have been found guilty and sentenced to death. But I think the reason why he suffered was because he's, he too was tricky. He too was corny. He wasn't honest. For him to kill the key witness, for him to kill the only person who knew the truth, shows that he too was hiding something. And God punished him for it. For Tokoto to go down for something he most likely did not do could indicate that his hands wasn't also clean. Maybe he wasn't a ritualist. But since his eldest son, Obi Dioza, was a kidnapper, he knew about it and most likely aided it, then there's a chance that Otokoto had a hand in that kidnapping aspect that his son was involved in. Because I don't understand why this man has all these hotels, businesses, and all this money, and have children abroad, and your son is a notorious kidnapper, and your son is a known kidnapper. Then there is something about the wealth that I think actually is questionable. People would say you can't judge a father for the sin of the son. True, but, well, I mean, we can't, but we are. We're doing it. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's going to happen. If the man knew his son was a kidnapper and was preventing him or preventing the law from catching up with him, it meant that he too was gaining from the kidnapping. It meant that he too might know something about it. It meant that. Man, this has been a long story to talk. I don't know how many minutes this would be, but the Otokoto Monevicha story is one that baffles me. I took about a year to research on this story, to learn about it. I had to get court documents. I had to see uh, headlines from that time because I didn't want to read headlines from 2020 or 2015. I wanted to see what the newspapers were saying at that time as in the hot. And, you know, it was interesting to learn about all these things. But I want to hear you guys' opinion. I want to hear your thoughts on Officer Obasi. I want to hear your thoughts on the killing, whether or not you think the killing actually happened at Umba River or it happened at Otokoto Hotel. I want to hear your thoughts on whether you think uh, Chief Leonard 
was really guilty of sending this boy to do the killing despite the fact that he was not home to receive it because we still don't know why only innocent Eke Ayanwu knew it but he was killed I want to know how you felt about learning on officer Obasi especially knowing that he was the one who actually killed innocent Eke Ayanwu why would he do that if innocent was cooperating or telling him what he wanted to hear why would he have to beat and strangle him to death me personally even if innocent could not could speak english very well the fact that a criminal was beaten to stupor to confess to a crime makes me doubt that confession because let me tell you if you slap me and hit me and threaten to kill me just so i can admit to something i did not do i will admit to it you don't even need to raise your hand once i did it just don't don't cause pain on me so anytime I think about it, I'm like, even if the boy could speak English very well, he was an English professor, the fact that he was he sustained serious beating and torture just to get a confession out of him makes me still doubt that confession. Talk more of the fact that he died. He died before the confession was even released. Makes me even believe. And you have to know something. Him signing on the confession was thumbprint. The only people there when he was making these statements was of Officer Obasi and Innocent, okay, aka Ayanwu. So even after they've killed him, all Officer Abbasi have to do was put the ink on his hand and press his hand on the confession to claim that he signed it. They didn't use signature then because a dead person cannot do signature. So all they had to do was a thumbprint. So there was way to manipulate it. If he had killed this boy and forged the statement on his behalf, he could put the ink on the boy's hand and press it in the paper to make it look as though he signed it. I don't know why. The thing is then, in my mind, I'm like, the lawyers who defended Chief Otokoto and the rest were not fully informed. They were not given the enough things to work with, in my opinion. And it was not the lawyer's job. It was the investigation. It was the investigators that were supposed to provide all the evidence against this criminal. And the person who was in charge, Officer Obasi. And he was the one who killed the key witness and lost his life in the process i want to hear your thoughts i want to hear your opinions don't forget to like share and let me know how you feel about the story thank you guys for watching and don't forget to subscribe